Trust the Profits Breeders' Cup coverage is brought to you by Play Up Racebook, the most horse player friendly racebook in the industry. Play Up Racebook is always your best bet. One if by land, two if by sea. It's a full fledged European invasion. Let's do an Aiden O'Brien barn tour. Salutations and welcome, friends. I'm your host for this episode of Countdown to Keeneland. My name is Matthew DeSantis, and you can find me on Twitter at the handle at Failed to Menace. A big thank you for all of our new subscribers and followers on YouTube. If you're not already, make sure to press that subscribe button. Make sure to like, leave a comment below about who you like from Aiden O'Brien's barn in this 2022 Breeders' Cup. And that's what we're going to be doing today. We're going to be diving deep on the 10 horses that Aiden O'Brien the famed Irish trainer is going to be bringing over to the Breeders' Cup here at Keeneland in just a week's time. A lot of us who are maybe North American horse racing fans may not. We obviously know the name Aiden O'Brien, but we might not know all of his horses very well. So that's why we're going to dive deep into these horses, talk a little bit more about their chances in the different races that they're going to be entered in and get to know a little bit more about each. Before we do that, though, we just want to give a quick shout out to our sponsor, Play Up Racebook. Make sure to check out and sign up and deposit at Play Up Racebook today and receive a 50% deposit bonus for up to $250. Additionally, for the Breeders' Cup, they have a particular special. If you deposit $100 or more before the Breeders' Cup on Friday, you will get an additional free $25 wager. Great deal. I've already signed up. I've already done it. I encourage you to do it as well. They're they're a great site. They have a great app as well. They have a lot of different tools for handicapping. Really try to look out for the players, not just trying to take your money, which is sadly what a lot of ADWs are trying to do. They're absolutely doing things the right way. They're a play up race book and a big thank you for their support on Trust the Profits. So like I said, we're going to dive into the Aiden O'Brien Barn Tour today. But if you want to catch up on some of the other barn tours I did, I've covered Charlie Appleby, Brad Cox, Todd Pletcher, Bob Baffert, Steve Asmussen. So we're going to be doing another one here on O'Brien. And then tomorrow, you can expect to see one on Chad Brown. And that will probably round things out. But next week, we got a ton of Breeders' Cup coverage. We got fantasy drafts where we're going to be having a lot of fun. Myself, Sarah El Bobby from Horse Racing Nation, Caitlin Free from uh, Twin Spires. Uh, you got uh, Chase Sessions from uh, Sports Gambling Podcast Network. The four of us are going to do kind of a fantasy draft where we draft our favorite horses uh, from the Distaff, Turf, and Classic. And we put together kind of teams, if you will, and then we'll score after uh, after the races are run we'll score things to see which team that we drafted ends up uh doing the best but it's a lot of fun i did it for the uh triple crown races and it was just a lot of fun it was it's a different way of thinking about the races and a different uh maybe a different twist on a typical handicapping show but it'll be great all three of them are wonderful wonderfully knowledgeable and insightful so make sure to check that out but we'll be doing capping the card for the th Friday and the Saturday races, obviously, uh, at Keeneland. I also have my man, Mal Bamford, uh, coming on. He's uh, he's a Brit. He's coming over. He's going to be talking to us about the Europeans and even deeper dive. That is going to be coming out next week as well. So we got so much content. Make sure to like and subscribe. Well, like I said, today we're going to be diving into the Aiden O'Brien barn and taking a look at what he is bringing over this year. And he always is bringing over a lot of a lot of horses, and in many ways, he reminds me of maybe now the European version of Todd Pletcher. We talked about how Pletcher brings 10, 11, 12 horses seemingly every year to the Breeders' Cup. May not hit at a very high strike rate. That's kind of what you're seeing with Aiden O'Brien. So let's dive into the numbers. And Aiden O'Brien's Breeders' Cup record is actually maybe not as stellar as people think it is. The reputation is certainly there. And I would say back in the early 2000s and kind of mid, you know, 20 teens, if you will, he had a real hot streak, but he's really cooled off over the last few years. So in his career, 158 starters, only 13 wins. That's about an 8.2% win rate. Okay. Uh, 22 seconds, 13 thirds. So he's in the money about 30% of the time with the horses he brings over, but 
he's he runs very hot and cold when you go back and look at how his horses perform at the Breeders' Cup. Now, that said, the last time he had a real strong heater, if you will, at the Breeders' Cup was just a couple of years back in 2020 when the Breeders' Cup was at Keeneland. He was actually six for nine finishing in the money that year. That said, over the last five years, Aiden O'Brien is two for 51 winning at the Breeders' Cup. Okay, so he's only winning at a 4% rate over the last five years. Some of the stronger European horses are coming out of John Gosden's barn, coming out of Charlie Appleby's barn. So you're seeing a little bit of a balance of power shifting in the European trainers. We talked all already about Charlie Appleby, the horses he brings over. He's winning in an astonishing 55, 56% clip uh, in his career. Now he's bringing over a bigger contingent than he normally does this year. So we'll see if that trend continues because if it does, he's going to win like two or three, <laughs> three of the races because he's only bringing over four or five. So like I said, it'll be interesting to see whether or not these horses that Aiden O'Brien's bringing over if they respond well to Keeneland uh, and how that all plays out. But obviously a lot of success there. Most recently with Order of Australia, who's actually running in this year's Breeders' Cup mile as well, but won that race back in 2020 at Keeneland. Obviously, you have a horse like Mendelssohn, Magician, St. Nicholas Abbey, always a, a just a special story because of course his son, who is now a trainer, Joseph O'Brien, was actually the jockey on St. Nicholas Abbey. And it was always funny when you go back and watch those clips. Uh, the announcer, I think it was uh, Trevor Denman, I think, referred to him as uh, Joey O'Brien, uh, which we don't call him Joey O'Brien anymore. He's grown up a little bit, and now he's Joseph O'Brien. So that was obviously a very special moment. First time that ever happened, a son winning a race for his father at the Breeders' Cup. Then you have High Chaparral, obviously that dominant win in 2002, that dead heat in 2003, just a really special moment. And the first of uh, O'Brien's uh, winners was Johannesburg. So He's had some memorable wins over the years. Like I said, the last five years, only two for 51. So, you know, the name always, I, I think, strikes fear into the heart of American turf lovers because, uh, you know, you say Aiden O'Brien's horses are coming over and people think, wow, okay, they're going to dominate us. Well, they haven't necessarily dominated us. Uh, now, they, they, they've they maybe dominated some of the American horses, but there's typically better Europeans that are coming over actually. So that's a little bit of what we're seeing there. And so it's just something to keep in mind. Don't always bet on a reputation that may not be the current one. I mean, that's, we talked about that a little bit with Todd Pletcher with obviously a great reputation. He's got a great barn only winning at an 8% clip as well. I mean, compare that to people like Asmussen and Bafford who are winning at about a 15, 16% clip, Brad Cox winning at a 31% clip, um, Charlie Appleby winning at a 55% clip. Now, granted, those last two have smaller sample sizes, but Baffert and Asmussen, I think, are apt comparisons. Those two obviously have entered a lot of horses over the years and are winning at almost twice the rate that you see from O'Brien and Pletcher. So something to keep in mind there with those races. And certainly the turf races are much more wide open in general. So I think it's tougher to get those super high winning percentages as opposed to some of the dirt races where... You know, I, I think Americans kind of have that a little bit more cornered. I think there are certain trainers who have that a little bit more cornered. And so you might see Asmussen and Baffert do a little bit better just because of the nature and the number of uh, horses, quite frankly, entering those races. But let's talk about O'Brien's starters for this year. And he's got, like I said, 10. He's got five adults, five juveniles. I'm actually a little higher on the juveniles that he's bringing over than the adults. But starting off in the turf division, He's going to have Broom and Stone Age. These are two very good horses. Uh, Broom is a horse that has been keeping impeccable competition. Uh, he keeps the best company. He may not have what he once did. I think he's definitely lost a step from what he once was, but you can never argue with the fact that he runs against the best. I mean, obviously, the last time out was eighth place in the arc, uh, which was just a loaded field of the very best turf horses in the world and came in eighth that day over very, very, very soggy ground. Similarly, you have a horse like Stone Age. That's a horse that typically presses the pace these days uh, and is a little bit more of a pace setter up front, but uh, still can still can pull out some wins and, and has had uh, some nice races 
uh, over the last couple of years. Um, but like I said, he, he does seem to fade a little bit, but still runs at that very high level fifth in the champion stakes last time out. Uh, that was at Ascot again, over some softer turf. And so one of the things you notice about O'Brien's horses is they actually don't, a lot of them don't mind firmer turf. So a lot of times we think of European horses as being firm turf adverse to some extent that they prefer the softer turf. That may be true to a point, but some of the, like the situation over at, uh, uh, Longchamp with the arc. I mean, that was yielding. I mean, that was a hot mess to run in that uh, turf. They, so they don't like that. They don't like the extreme uh, soft and yielding sur turf uh, surface, at least. Maybe one or two might, but most horses don't. And so, you know, a little firmer turf may not be the worst thing. And clearly, O'Brien's had success at Keeneland before. So something to keep in mind. The one returning champion from O'Brien's Barn is, of course, Order of Australia, who won that 2020 Breeders' Cup mile and is coming back. Uh, Order of Australia ran here in the United States last time out, finished third at the Keeneland Turf Mile. Actually, I thought a really good race. I mean, I didn't have much hope for him in that race. And, you know, he and Ivar put in a nice run there at the end to finish behind Annapolis. That was not a bad effort. And I'll be honest that. Yeah, I, I think you're going to get a really honest price with Order for Australia because he certainly he won the Breeders' Cup at a big price two years ago. This is not the worst horse. I mean, I think, again, this shows the depth of European racing that a horse like Order of Australia, who is, you know, been like kind of looked over in the European ranks, can come over here to the United States and run competitively in grade ones and, and be right there with some of our best turf horses. So just something to keep in mind. Then you have his two fillies and mares who are coming over for uh, the Philly and Mare Turf Tuesday and Toy. Toy coming off a pretty long layoff, but last time winner at the Garnet Stakes. And then Tuesday, who was kind of a little bit of his superstar earlier this year, has faded and faltered a little bit, has run against the boys a few times. So has been running against very, very good competition. That last time out was on Arc Weekend at the La Opera. And that was also very soggy ground, very yielding surface. So didn't run her best race that day, but there's a reason to think this horse can absolutely rebound. This is a very, very good filly. Uh, let no, no one say anything differently. Tuesday's a very, very good horse. Uh, so you should definitely be on the lookout for her. Then you have the five juveniles, starting with Virginia Road and Cairo going to the juvenile turf. Both of those coming off grade three wins, uh, Virginia Road winning at the De Conde and then uh, Cairo winning at the Kelvinau, uh stakes. And both of those were really solid efforts. I think these are two very, very good horses. Virginia Road seems to be a horse that keeps getting better. Uh, Cairo seems to be a horse that also is just very, very consistent. These are two solid performers and with the juveniles, you never know how progression ends up impacting them. You never know how they take to new ground as well. That's always a question mark. But certainly, I think two legitimate threats in that division. Then when you go to the juvenile Phillies turf, this is where I actually may have my favorite of his horses, Meditate. It's the horse I really like here. Um, finished second last time out. But this is a horse I think it is very, very good. Uh, and again, speaks to the depth of the European field because a couple of the horses that beat meditate, I think are absolute freaks over there. Taria being one of them and meditate was right there with her and, and, you know, finished second that day and finished second then in the Chevrolet park stakes, but has been running group one races and has just had a really strong resume leading up to this point. Never ending story. No slouch of, uh, no slouch of her own coming in third at the Marcel Boussac, Again, that was during that Longchamp weekend, so that turf was particularly yielding and soft. Now, is that something that helped Never Ending Story, hurt Never Ending Story? We'll have to wait and see. But another very, very good performing horse. Many of Aesop's Fable finished second in the Doncaster. Maybe the, well, I don't want to say the weakest of his entries because I'm not necessarily sold on a few of his older horses either. But I, I do think Aesop's Fable is probably you're going to get a pretty big price on this horse uh, going into the juvenile turf sprint, though that race is wide open. So we'll see. I mean, I I have strong feelings about the Platinum Queen. I think that horse is just, you know, she's going to be heads and shoulders above everybody else. But we'll just have to wait and see uh, how some of our American horses turn out. You know, Tyler's Tribe trying the turf for the first time, Speedboat Beach, the Baffert horse going on turf for the second time, a horse like Nagarok, the Grand Motion horse, who, who I think is really talented. Uh, and so there's a lot of horses in that mix there and in, in that juvenile turf sprint, Aesop's Fable being one of them. 
But like I said, let's dive into some of these a little bit more. And let's take a look first at Broom. And this is a horse that has obviously a long running line. This is not even all of the entries. But this is a horse that absolutely has run up against the very best. You see a lot of grade one efforts there. Rarely do you even see a group two effort. Uh, this is a horse that runs against the very best uh, and, you know, came over to the United States in the sword dancer, had a little bit of trouble uh, in that start, actually starting out of the gate. Uh, otherwise, I thought ran a pretty good race. Like I said, this horse has kept phenomenal company. He hasn't necessarily been in his best form lately, um, but I think you can rack up the last two on turf, uh, you know, to, to conditions. Both were over very soft ground. And then if you look at American start, like I said, three back at the sword dancer, he had some trouble coming out of the gate. I will say, if you like broom, you'll probably get a pretty honest price on this horse. Uh, but this is a horse that has kept incredibly good company has run up against the very best, uh, in, that Europe has to offer. So we'll certainly not be intimidated. Um, and as you know, like I said, run up against all of the big horses over there. And it's a horse that's incredibly consistent. If you look at those time form numbers, you know, they don't have buyers speed figures over there. But if you look at the time form numbers, all was very, very consistent, somewhere between about a high 100 and like eight to like a 120, like always right there, really rarely ever turns in a performance where you scratch your head, uh, even when he finishes a little further back. So this is a horse that, like I said, I think maybe the best efforts have been behind him, but some of the better horses in front of him over in Europe aren't coming over. So suddenly a horse like Broom, I think, you know, like I said, may have a little bit of a shot. Well, let's go to his stable mate who will also be running in the tarf, and that is Stone Age. Stone Age is a horse, you have to understand from a pace standpoint, who will probably go out and be on or near the lead. And it's interesting because that's not the way he ran when he was here in the United States, but when he was overseas, that's typically how he runs. He typically goes out and is among the horses that are up front, uh, if not setting the pace. And yet here you go back, you look at those two races at Belmont and at Saratoga was a little bit more mid pack in those races. That's really not his style. So this is a horse that might want to get out on that lead a little bit more uh, and be a little bit more aggressive out of the gate if possible. Again, Stone Age is a horse that will, you know, command a, a pretty big price. I mean, th these are the last time out was a 40 to one shot uh, at the Champagne Stakes or the Champion Stakes, I should say, over at Ascot. Again, this will be a pretty tight turnaround. That race was just about three weeks ago. So this is a horse that is going to be running regularly and has been running regularly. These European horses are used to that. Are, are, I shouldn't say they're used to, but they're more accustomed to that quick turnaround. Uh, in races is not uncommon. You saw a horse like Modern Games, for instance, run in Woodbine, go back over, run at um, the British Champion Stakes, come back over here now. You know, and so just they're used to being kind of globe trotters a little bit, and uh, that's just what you get out of horse like uh, Stone Age. Like I said, just ran three weeks ago for you know good to soft turf. Although you talk to the people over there, they would say it was closer to soft to yielding in a lot of spots, not so much good to soft. So uh, something to keep in mind those turf conditions, but you'll notice the last two times out over in Europe, this horse commanded a pretty big price, 40 to one, 26 to one, uh, the last two times out at the Irish champion stakes and the champion stakes. So it's something to keep in mind over there has not necessarily been a favorite is a favorite when he drops down in class a little bit to those group three races. Again, a horse that may not be coming in at the best form and a horse I'll probably fade and look past in a lot of spots because I just think there's better horses in this field. So let's go to the champion, uh, Order of Australia, who won this race, like I said, two years ago. Uh, did not run particularly well last year at, Keen, uh, at uh, I should say, last year at the Breeders' Cup. But last year at the Keeneland Turf Mile, uh, came over and ran in that race uh, rather than running at the Breeders' Cup. Did not run particularly well there. So has, you know, like I said, run well once at Keeneland, but uh, not well run well there recently. Um and, but then came back this, just this past year and ran well again. Uh, so you'll see the career effort there at Keeneland is three races, one win, one third. And so not a bad running line for a horse that will command, like I said, a higher price. You look back, this horse running, you know, legitimate grade ones and group ones overseas, finishing respectably second, fourth, occasional seventh, an occasional first, an occasional third. You know, so this horse is absolutely competitive over there and has been running against good competition it just feels like there's probably a better horse in this field i mean modern games is the horse that of course is looming over everyone in this breeders cup mile order of australia though like i said really does speak to just how deep 
this particular field is uh, because and, and deep that European crop is because Order of Australia is a nice turf horse and is a nice miler, but by no stretch is an elite one. And yet was able to come over and run very, very well at our best grade one at the turf mile and, and finish third in that race. So like I said, we'll, um, is, is a horse you have to take seriously. Uh, but, uh, you go back and look at some of those other races that he's run in. He's been beaten by a horse like dream Loper, who's also entered in the breeders cup mile dream. Lo- uh, Loper is coming off a win in a group one over in Europe. He, when he ran against modern games before he was beaten by, I want to say nine and a half lengths by modern games. Now he likes clean, uh, Keeneland, like I said, two of the last three times, two of his only three times he's been here. He's run well. But it's a lot to ask potentially for this horse to run up against much better competition and now suddenly perform better. So probably, again, looking around or Australia in the Breeders' Cup mile. So let's talk about two of his fillies uh, starting with Tuesday. Uh, Tuesday's a fascinating horse. Um, Like I said, has faded a little bit lately. The bloom was a little off the rose. But if you look the last two times out over very soft ground, again, those long chomp races, very soft ground that does affect these horses. They don't always like soft ground. The firmer the turf for Tuesday, typically the better she performs. This is a horse that if you look actually finished second to Alpinista three back. Why do I bring that up? Alpinista of course is the mayor who won the arc. So Tuesday absolutely has kept phenomenal company and has, has a race to go back to, you know, you talk about back class Tuesday has a race to run back to that absolutely could win this race. Okay. If she runs back to what she did three back back to what she did, like five races back, she absolutely is capable of winning this race. Like I said, she's not been in the best form the last two. I think you can absolutely make an argument that it's because of the ground that she's been covering, but something again, to keep in mind when thinking about how to handicap this sprint, Right now, it looks like the weather in Keeneland is actually going to be very nice. This turf should be pretty firm, I would imagine. And uh, there's really, I think there's rain in the forecast on Monday. But other than that, it looks sunny and clear or cloudy and clear uh, the rest of the week at Keeneland. And pretty nice temperatures, highs in the high 60s, low 70s. So that turf should be pretty firm and well cared for by the time we get there next week. So Tuesday should like that turf. I think this is one of O'Brien's better horses that he's bringing over this year. I think Tuesday absolutely does have a shot in this spot. So his other filly that is in this race is Toy. And Toy is a little bit of a wild card factor. This is a horse that you can see took a huge break, uh, was off for over a year from August 7th till October 10th or October 16th, I should say, then comes back over soft ground and wins at the Garnet Stakes. Not a group uh, race, but nevertheless, winning a stakes race off the bench after a really long layoff. This is a horse that, like I said, is quite interesting. If you look back at her previous efforts, last year they were kind of middling. You know, as as a two-year-old, she didn't really overwhelm. Um, she ran okay in some spots, not very well in other spots when she ran up against Nashua, who's probably going to be the favorite in this particular race, Nashua crushed her and it wasn't even close. I mean, I think she finished ninth or 10th in that race and Nashua won by seven and a half, you know, eight lengths. So Nashua was much the best that day. That said, Toy is a horse that, like I said, last time that was the first time she ever ran up three years old. So we always talk about progression of horses from two to three years old. Toys, a horse that may still be progressing, may still be improving, ran her best speed figure in after that long layoff coming back as a three-year-old now. Could Toy potentially make another step? She'd have to make a substantial step. Let me be clear. She would have to make a big step to win this race. But she's an X factor. And I, I, this is a horse I will be very keenly interested in watching the reports coming in, how she looks at the track, how she looks covering ground, how she just, you know, how she's warming up, how she takes to the paddock, et cetera. I'll be very, very interested in this horse. I think you're going to get a big price on her, but I would be very intrigued to see how she runs in this particular spot. Well, let's head to the juveniles and he's got five of them. And I actually think he's got a a much stronger two-year-old crop than a three-year-old crop, in my opinion, uh, or a three and up uh, year old crop, I should say. 
So Victoria Road, let's start here. I mean, this is a horse that uh, I really like Victoria Road quite a bit. Uh, won the last three over very different ground as well. Good ground, firm turf, good to soft. So one over three different conditions, going three different lengths, seven furlongs, a mile and a mile and an eighth. So you see this horse stretching out in distance, should have no issue continuing to stretch out in distance. Um, I think is a very live shot. Increasing speed figures as well the last three times out. You look 77, 83, 92, continuing to get faster and faster and faster as a two-year-old. That's the trajectory you like to see from these young horses. Here's the other thing. Two out ago, beat the horse Blue Rose Zen. Why do I bring up that? Because Blue Rose Zen, of course, won a group one at Longchamp over the Arc weekend. Blue Rose Zen not coming over. Victoria Road, though, beat Blue Rose Zen. So if you were a big fan of Blue Rose Zen, thinking she was going to come over, if Victoria Road is a horse that's gotten the best of her, like it's the best of him and could continue to progress. And so, uh, Victoria Road, I, I know I always refer to her as a she, it's a boy, uh, because Victoria, I know, I just, it's, it's a bad habit I have. I don't know why I do that. I, I do that with some horses. I used to, the late Medina Spirit, I would always tr refer to as a she, something I always thought was feminine about the name Medina. Um, but, uh, probably because of the funky Cole Medina, but that's a whole nother story. But, uh, Victoria Road, though, very, very good horse. And, and he'll, like I said, he's been progressing nicely. I, I like everything that he's been doing. And uh, this is a horse I think is a very, very live shot at winning in this particular spot. So let's talk to his other uh, horse that's going to be in the juvenile turf. And that is Cairo. Uh, Cairo, very accomplished horse as well. More lightly raced, obviously, only four career efforts. But as you can see there, has never finished out of the money. Uh, one last time out over yielding turf is going to be stretching out here, obviously, a little bit, running most of his races at six and seven furlongs, is going to be stretching out. But um, one going a mile before over good surface uh, in Ireland. So that's something that obviously is uh, noteworthy, I think, to to make note of. Um, and a very legitimate horse in this spot. I, I think you look at a horse like Cairo and, and you know, it's hard to really nitpick a lot there. This horse, you know, you might say, well, it's, Will he be able to handle the extra distance? Maybe. Uh, has he? He's not necessarily run up against the best competition. You notice that he's only run up against that one group three last time out, and that was over a yielding surface. So you never know, was it just the surface that allowed him to get that win that day? I mean, those are things we always get a little worried about. We even talk about that here in the United States, particularly with dirt horses. If a horse wins on a sloppy sealed track, you go, well, is that, was that a one-time effort or is this something that can be replicated? Same thing's true on turf. You know, when you see horses win on yielding, you go, well, okay, like, was that the, was that the turf conditions? Did the other horses not take to it very well? Was he the one who did? And, you know, you just want to see. Now, the fact that he has won on good turf before at a mile, that that's obviously a, a huge positive for, uh, for Cairo in this spot. Uh, and, and one of the seconds I should mention is on synthetic. So very capable horse. I think you'll probably get a an honest price on this horse. Again, a horse that continues to get better in those speed figures, 76, 85, 92, continues to get stronger as he runs. You like to see that progression. So this is one area where I think uh, O'Brien has a very live shot. So let's go to Never Ending Story. This is uh, another one of his fillies. And Never Ending Story, very nice run at Longchamp. Uh, and was next best to Blue Rosen that day. So Blue Rosen that day, uh, you know, won the race in the Marcel Boussac, but a never ending story, if you notice, was third by a neck basically to the second place horse. Blue Rosen won by five lengths. But then if you look out of everybody else that was running, never ending story was right there with the second place horse. So very, very good effort there last time out. Again, those speed figures aren't quite up to where. Um, you know, some of the other horses are in this particular race, but again, a lot to like there. Absolutely bred to stretch out. You have the Dabawi up top, uh, a Camelot influence underneath. This is a horse that is absolutely bred to go the distance, even though her longest distance to this point is only a mile. She 
she'll be able to stretch out. That's not an issue at all uh, for a horse like Never Ending Story. Uh, I, I think that race last time out was a real kind of eye opener for a lot of people. That was a really good effort because before that, you know, she had finished fourth but was well beaten. She had finished, you know, third in a grade two. Had does have a grade one, uh, grade a group three victory, but kind of started her career off pretty strong. And then, you know, when stepping up in class, wasn't quite there. And then finally, like I said, uh, ran very well in that Marcel Boussac and uh, Blue Rose Sen. If, if she were to come over, it would have been one of the favorites. So let's talk about Meditate. This is maybe my favorite horse that he's bringing over. Um, I would encourage everybody to go back and watch. Um, the Moy Glare stud uh, group one uh, from Cora to back. Uh, that was a phenomenal effort between uh, she and uh, Taria. Just a tremendous, tremendous race. Those two were so much better than everybody else. <laughs> uh, even though she lost that day, she was six clear of everybody else. Here's the thing I like about Meditate. One, uh, she was a stud as a, a you know, a, a early on. She was so, so good. And then even taking a break, coming back, and continuing the dominant effort has never finished out of the exacta has been running against group company over in Europe pretty much. So since she broke her maiden and here's the other thing, look at her running lines. Look at the fact that she has been the favorite in four of her six career races. And the two times she wasn't the favorite, she was basically two and a half to one. Okay. She's basically like five to two. Um, she is always going to get bet. She is an impeccably bred horse. She is an impressive horse. The question is stretching out. Will she be able to take more distance? I, I don't have much doubt about that. This is absolutely a super impressive horse, though. I love Meditate. She's very, very good. You see those time form rating figures, you know, 10 points higher than Never Ending Story. Granted, covering a little less distance, but I, I think Meditate is a very live shot in this particular field. And then we'll finish up with Aesop's Fables. This is a horse that is, you know, okay. I think this is probably the, the longest shot of any of O'Brien's horses, perhaps. Uh, and But that said, it's entered into the most wide open field in terms of the juvenile turf sprint. Aesop's Fables starts off with two career victories, but then kind of steps up in class, runs against some group one company, finishes fourth, nothing terrible, but is you know, pretty easily beaten in both of those races. Then comes back, Doncaster does finish second in that last race. Uh, you know, Will, I, I think, will probably benefit from a firmer turf uh, and a firmer uh, ground. If you notice, those first two efforts were over good turf. So I, I think there'll be something there for Aesop's Fables to like in terms of running at Keeneland. But absolutely a horse uh, that should be maybe considered in deeper exotics. You know, if you're playing verticals and maybe including a horse like Aesop's Fables, which you'll probably get a pretty good price on. But uh, like I said, probably one of the bigger long shots of, uh, of O'Brien's barn in this particular spot. Like I said, might prefer that firmer turf. Um, and in a wide open race, you can absolutely view that as a positive, uh, that this is a horse that, like I said, has seemed to flatten off a little bit uh, from that effort uh, back in August, but uh, it has a race to run back to, though. Like if she can go back and run that race from August at Cura in the Futurity Grade 2, or Group 2, I should say, that's a race to run back to. That absolutely is good enough to, to be in contention in this spot. So, you know, she's run against some good horses. She's got ability. There's no doubt about it. But again, this one feels like maybe there's just better top end speed in this race. But like I said, very wide open field. Well, that is the Aiden O'Brien Barn Tour, all 10 of his horses for the 2022 Breeders' Cup. Like I said, remember, only two for uh, 51 the last five years, only winning at a 4% clip. I might have liked a few of his horses. I think realistically, maybe there's one winner out of this group, maybe two at best. But again, last time he was at Keeneland, he racked up six out of nine in the money. So something to keep in mind, certainly when handicapping those O'Brien horses. Remember to like and subscribe all of our content here on Trust the Profits. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and make sure to check out our sponsor, Play Up Racebook. You can go today and get a 50% deposit bonus for up to $250. Additionally, if you deposit $100 or more before next Friday's Breeders' Cup, you will get an additional $25 free wager. So make sure to check out Play Up Racebook. Until next time, friends, my name is Matthew DeSantis. You can find me on Twitter at Fail to Menace. And I wish you a happy and prosperous day at the races and remind you,
That is now post time. Trust the Profits Breeders' Cup coverage is brought to you by Play Up Racebook, the most horse player friendly racebook in the industry. Play Up Racebook is always your best bet.